Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast event, a collaborative effort between Matthias Corbinus Collegium in Budapest and New Direction in Brussels. Uh, today's event will deal with centralization and subsidiarity as two alternative pathways for the future of Europe. Now, to say that the EU stands at a crossroads has become something of a cliche among the Brussels commentariat. In fact, by some accounts, you could argue the EU was born at the crossroads. It has always been at the crossroads and perhaps will forever remain at the crossroads of something. The tangle of dilemmas that the Union faces at the moment is profound. It runs a whole gamut of policy issues from coordinating uh, relief efforts after COVID to dealing with the effects of climate change, mitigating those, uh, and even carving Europe's role in the growing Central American geopolitical rivalry. These challenges are obviously all vexing in their own specific ways, and yet they're all underpinned by one institutional dilemma, namely how to best apportion power between uh, the supranational institutions of the EU and the 27 member states. Now, EU treaties, turns out, are rather unequivocal in how uh, that balance of power should be struck. Uh, in an effort to ensure that decisions are taken as close as possible to the citizens who are going to be affected by them, already in 1992, the Maastricht Treaty in its Article 3 stressed, and I quote, that in areas which do not fall within its exclusive competence, the community shall take action in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity only if and in so far as the objectives of the proposed action cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states and can therefore, by reason of the scale or effects of the proposed action, be better achieved by the community. Now, these conditions ought to be met cumulatively, and yet too often the Commission has acted as if it had been given a blank check. With a conference on the future of Europe already fully underway, we gather this morning to discuss and dissect the crisis of subsidiarity with two distinguished panelists. Uh, on to my left, presenting here in, in Budapest, Rodrigo Valleste, heads uh, MCC Center for European Studies. And joining us remotely from Brussels is Robert Tyler, who is a senior policy advisor at New Direction, the foundation of reference for conservative parties across Europe. Now, uh, Rodrigo, let's start with you. Uh, let's get a bit of a bare bones diagnosis here. Uh, before you join MCC, you dedicated uh, your career to uh, distinguished service in uh, the European institutions. You served in several of the European Commission's directorates, Home Affairs, Justice. You also served in the cabinet of then Commissioner Tibor Novacic, uh, who headed, uh, who, uh, headed uh, educational matters in John Cook Juncker's Commission. So let me ask you right away, um, is subsidiarity a dead letter? How did it go from being this all-encompassing constitutional principle to being essentially a toothless platitude at times and what are, in your judgment, the policy areas that have been most affected by the trend towards federalizing companies? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge, uh, for your introduction. And thanks also for the, to the colleagues of, uh, of New Direction for joining us on this joint event. It's very, very important to speak up. You know, we have a very good occasion to do it now in the debate on the future of Europe. This is you know, one more example that uh, Matthias Torgenis' colleague is taking in uh, collaboration with, uh, with, with colleagues from New Direction you know, to make sure that all voices, not only the usual voices, are heard in Brussels. The subsidiarity is not a dead leg, huh? I wouldn't say so. So just to, to start with, let me just give you some uh, bit of, of, of legal background on that. From a strictly legal point of view, the principle of subsidiarity applies what we call the shared competence of the European Union. So you have the exclusive competences, very few there in the treaty, this is in the treaty, and then you have the shared competences, which are basically like dormant competences. Yeah. Those are fields where you know the, the member states are, are dealing with until the European Union starts dealing with them. And the question is when, you know, under what circumstances can the European Union start dealing with them? And one compass that you have to decide is precisely the principle of subsidiarity. So that's from a street, the street, the legal point of this is what it means. I wouldn't say that later, because every time the, Europe, the Commission, for example, uh, drafts the impact assessment before uh, proposing a legislation, they analyze it somehow. Then in the proposal, in the, in the communication, you also have a couple of paragraphs on that. You also have an annual report. That would be a mistake to start the conversation now, because the subsidiarity is much more than that. It's not only a principle, a legal principle that applies in very specific circumstances, it's also one of the main philosophical, you know, uh, uh, cornerstones of the European Union. And this is where your question makes more sense. 
do we still respect subsidiarity as one of the you know like the, the core principles you know in the EU's daily business? I think that's a relevant question. And we can also speak about the cultural subsidiarity. Because again, here we cannot only have this technocratic and legal angle, it's much more than that. And then it's true that what I miss sometimes is also this cultural subsidiarity in the political positions that the Commission is taking, that sometimes also the Council is taking, that the European Council recently took as well. I would maybe make an exception with the Parliament. The Parliament is free to speak about whatever it wants. But again, it becomes problematic when it's asking the Commission, for example, to take actions in fields where she thought, where the E1 doesn't have any competences whatsoever. And finally, I also miss this reflex, you know, like this, this uh, mindset of subsidiarity, also in the courts, uh, in the case law of the Court of Justice. You know? And here, you know, we are also speaking indirectly about the principle of conferral of competences, which is actually the same article of the treaty, Article 5. Even Article 4 and Article 5, especially, where you know uh, it's very clearly stated that whatever has not been given to the European Union remains a national competence. And then I'm sometimes afraid to see that uh, even the Court of Justice, you know, has a very flexible interpretation of the legal business, and sometimes the one that contradicts the truth. And uh, maybe we can come back to that later, but there is a very, very recent example of last week. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll give you maybe more details later. So that let you know that indeed it's one of the, of, it's a core cardinal principle that you know, is, you know it deserves to be given much more, much more attention and implementation. Sure. Well, uh, turning to you, uh, Robert, um, obviously New Direction, the foundation that you serve, uh, was founded in 2009 by uh, a lady who was uh, hanging in the portrait behind you, uh, Margaret Thatcher. She was a noted critic of federalism. She will forever be remembering uh, for railing against what she called the European super state. And uh, the, Euro the, the ECR party, the European Conservatives and the Reformist Party, to which New Direction is affiliated, proclaims in its founding Prague Declaration the sovereign integrity of the nation state, opposition to EU federalism, and a renewed respect for true subsidiary. Can you unpack what some of that means for you at New Direction? And uh, what are some of the roadblocks that you've witnessed from Brussels uh, towards uh, subsidiary being upheld? So I think at the core of the principle is obviously this belief that, you know, national governments do things better, or, or rather that if you were to take um, sort of the work of Friedman or even de Tocqueville, where th there is an understanding that actually policy that is made at the localest possible level on a voluntary basis is much more effective as a means of uh, cooperating than being told from above what to do. And uh, one of the things that uh, the ECR was founded on was actually in the opposition to the Lisbon Treaty and into its uh, increased centralization of power, especially taking national competencies away from the member states and saying that, you know, this is something that's better handled in a, a collective way. Um, and I, you know, it, it, it started with simple things like it was about a, a common tariff area and, you know, common regulatory standards within the European Union. But then it expanded to include fisheries and farming. And, you know, with Lisbon, it introduced dynamics on foreign policy and security policy. Uh, and more recently, we've seen subsidiarity undermined with sort of emergency measures that are, are totally out of line with what the treaty says. So, for example, working on areas like health policy and social policy, uh, they, you know, they've taken the advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to say, actually, we can do it better. When in reality, the more effective responses at the beginning of the pandemic came from mutual cooperation between member states. So, for example, if you remember when when the outbreak first started in Italy, it was Polish doctors and Czech piece, um, Czech medical equipment that was voluntarily flown in to support the Italians early on. It wasn't something done from the centre. It was only later that the European Union thought, well, we ought to also be having a go at this. So the, the core view is that actually that kind of mutual bilateral cooperation is far more effective than working on a supranational level and sort of dictating from above, because as we've seen, it's, it's much slower, it's much more cumbersome, much more bureaucratic, and in many ways, much more expensive as well. 
And precisely on this point, I wanted to briefly um, get both of your takes on the role of COVID. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, Robert, um, you know, the, the European Commission really seized on the pandemic as an opportunity to, you know, centralize management, um, obviously, not just by drumming up these massive uh, sums of money that are going to be dispersed in the coming days as part of a recovery facility, 800 billion euros, but also uh, in terms of vaccine procurement, and I think that's perhaps also what's on your mind when you speak of yes. the effectiveness of, of centralized, essential planning when it comes to you know, supplying, procuring vaccines for 27 member states. Uh, can, I, can I get both of your perspectives, starting with Rodrigo? Do you think that uh, the pandemic will accelerate the trend towards um, centralization? Or do you think instead, as Robert mentioned, that some of the pitfalls and the disadvantages of a centralized management system are being uh, revealed by the pandemic? Which, which way do you think, how, how do you think the pandemic will affect? It depends on what fields. Huh? If you speak about only the health management, so health-related issues, or if you speak about, for example, the, the, the recovery funds and the, the next generation funds, for example. So, we should be new and uh, the pandemic related files go from health to uh, youth and employment. No? And so what are we speaking about? If we speak about the, uh, you know, the health related issues, there again, we have to be a bit nuanced and a bit fair. So also, uh, the, it seems now that uh, the figures, you know, the percentage of vaccinations in the EU is superior to the one in the US. No? So they, they had a worse start, but now they're catching up. Uh, personally, I believe that centralizing the purchase of the vaccines makes sense, per se makes sense. But if this COVID pandemic, it, it makes sense by the way, why you, know, you can get maybe cheaper prices because it would have been easier for strong states to get the vaccines before, I mean, maybe without decentralization. I wonder you know, if, uh, if uh, Bulgaria would have got the vaccines as quickly as uh, the Netherlands, for example, or as quick as Germany, maybe you would have had differences in price and things like that. It remains indeed that the Commission had little experience in negotiating this type of contracts. At the beginning, there was a huge cacophonian, and so that uh, it was far from being perfect. The idea, as such, I mean, let's see, let's wait a couple of months still, but it seems that the results are not as catastrophic as we anticipated in Feb back in February, March, and April. But the question is whether, you know, like this COVID is going to be an excuse once again you know, to give more powers to the European Union. And uh, there is that you have, uh, you know, like the, the usual suspects, every time there is a, the slightest problem, you know, they only have one answer. It's like a Pavlov reflex, more Europe, more Europe, more integration. They don't do an impact assessment. They don't think whether, you know, uh, whether the, 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 you know, the, the agility, for example, of the national level or the regional level, no. Whenever there is a problem on this earth, you know, more Europe. Depends. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. By the way, this is also I know, the proper implementation of this flux of subsidiarity reflected one careful, thorough one comes also into play. And so what I dislike, what I disagree with is this uh, battle of reflex of whatever happens more Europe. And another point as well is like, even if I disagree with that here, my, my biggest concern is that the European Union should act if it has a legal basis to do so. So if at the end of the day, the majority of the 27 member states, uh, the qualified majority, and together with the parliament decides to centralize more health in management at the EU level, it might be a bad idea. But if it's their decision, it's their decision. My biggest problem here is, you know, is the European Union taking decisions and anticipating decisions for which it has never been granted a competence. That's your red line. This is really one of the cardinal principles of the European Union. It's written really black and white in Article 4, and especially Article 5. And indeed, my point here is that I have the impression that those articles and those principles are neglected and overlooked. So, sorry for being a bit legal here. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be in favor of the further centralization of health policies in the European Union. If it's a legal, lawful decision, we will have to do it. But don't forget that the main problem is that when decisions are taken without a proper legal basis. And it's, it's very dangerous and it's very shocking even an institution that claims to be so, so much into the defense of the rule of law, mm -hmm. sometimes also forgets mm -hmm. to apply the, 
those principles to itself. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm mostly worried about. Well, quite to the contrary, where, where in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the main uh, purposes of a conversation such as this one is to really unpack the whole legal complexity of a, of a principle which, as Rodrigo really just, just said, um, seems to be, you know, um, enshrined in the constitutional marble, and yet the practice of public policy is oftentimes run afoul of subsidiarity. But um, I want to shift gears entirely to the question of European values and how that's being used to encroach upon the competences of member states. But before I do, I do that, I want to give you a chance to respond, uh, Robert, uh, because that there does seem, in my view, to be a bit of a dilemma when um, you seem to take a very strong view uh, against uh, federalization of competences in the regulatory uh, uh, sense, right? Um, regulation of uh, the internal market and of, of health, labor is, um, is oftentimes uh, you know, then uh, slight by, by the British when, when they were members. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, since, since those competence, competences have been indeed uh, conferred, uh, delegated to uh, the EU, how do you navigate this dilemma? Obviously, we've got, we had, when uh, the Brits were members, um, uh, you know, uh, authority in Brussels to regulate, you know, all sorts of different uh, markets, sectors, uh, services, goods. Um, What's, can you unpack for us some of your argument against uh, hyper-regulatory uh, centralization in Brussels? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll stick with the coronavirus example for a bit, if I may, which is that, you know, at the very beginning, the United Kingdom had the choice. It, it's join the collective effort with the European Union or go it alone. And I, I, whilst I appreciate that the European Union is finally catching up on the vaccines, it, it's still behind those countries that did do it alone and did it a different way. So, for example, the United Kingdom hired uh, a, ser a sort of panel of specialists led by a former pharmaceuticals executive, who I think had a much better understanding of how the pharmaceutical market worked. They, they bought the maximum number of doses of every available one, including the ones that didn't finally make it to market, just to hedge their bets on that and, and have the surplus if they needed it. The same was true in Israel, where the, the military was uh, mobilized to manage procurement and so on. Where, whereas I think part of the problem I had was that because of the bureaucratic way the European Commission thinks and works, it appointed a panel of European commissioners, none of whom had any medical experience and none of whom understood how the market worked. And so you ended up in this position where they were treating it more like the procurement of, of any other good rather than something for an emergency. So they ignored, for example, an offer from uh, Pfizer-BioNTech to buy a, the full 500 million doses when, when it was offered. They said, no, no, we'll get 200 million of this one for as cheap as possible uh, when it's available, and we'll get AstraZeneca, uh, 200 million of AstraZeneca and 200 million of the French one that never materialized. So, you know, this bureaucratic mindset and this regulatory mindset, I think, hampers centralization in many ways. Um, I, I think it, it shows that the European federalists are, uh, uh, in effect, the sort of victims of their own system. Um, I think it was uh, Thomas Edison who once said, the only thing that saves us from the bureaucracy is its inefficiency. Um, and that's certainly the case in Brussels. And, I, I, you know, it, it extends beyond that. I think. The, the European Commission is, is so obsessed with, I guess, the rule of law in one sense, which is that it wants to follow European Union law as though it's gospel and the only thing that could possibly work uh, to such a fault that uh, they're willing to ignore that other people can also write good regulation. Um, this was the, the one of the problems with the negotiation of the Brexit agreement. You know, the UK adopted the entire acqui communautaire on withdrawal of the European Union. But then they were told, oh, your standards aren't going to be the same as us, so they're not going to be equal and fair. And, you know, we've seen the same thing over and over again with external trade negotiations. We, we had the same obstacles with negotiating with the United States, with Canada, with India, with all sorts of potential partners worth billions. And, and the problem has always been, oh, well, we can't trust their regulatory standards. And yet, when we actually visit America for work or for vacation or or you know, even the 350 million Americans who live there have no problem with the regulations that are in place. I think there's a, a sort of overzealous caution that, that, that you know, European regulation is better and 
it, it, it plays into subsidiarity in the sense that suddenly they've become so untrusting of, of national member states and their ability to, to write equal or just or regulation that's just as good as what comes out of Brussels. So I, I think there's a there's a core problem there as well. If, if I may, add, if we want to have, to have a better and more meaningful implementation of the principle of subsidiarity, we should not be even part of the European Commission because every time we speak about a regulation, it means a regulation that has been approved by the Parliament and by the Council. In the vast majority of the cases, we have the ordinary procedure for the code decision. And so my question is, how how seriously do the does the Council of the representative of the member states take subsidiarity? How, uh, how seriously takes the Parliament? Uh, does the Parliament take subsidiarity into account? We can answer that clearly that uh, they don't, basically. They don't really care about it. But for example, you know, it's not only for this is a duty that you cannot only rely on the shoulders of the Commission. It is also for the member states to say, Commission, in your proposal, for example, I don't think that you know, the Theory was taken seriously. I don't think the analysis was deep enough. And I think it should be, I don't think we should agree on details, maybe only on some general principles. I don't know. So it's also the fault of the legislature. It's not only the person, the institution proposing the law, putting it on the table, it's also for the co legislators to take also the, the principles of the treaty more seriously. Well, precisely, um, let's shift gears to the issue of safeguarding a subsidiarity and, and what are the institutional um, uh, guardrails that have been put in place to make sure that this um, principle uh, does not become a uh, debt letter. And, and uh, indeed, as, as Polibo explains, national parliaments are entrusted. This is not just a matter of the Commission policing its own uh, role in, in uh, lawmaking, but also national parliaments making sure that you know, they stand their curve and that whenever the, com the commission encroaches upon their uh, sovereign areas of competence, that they have a way uh, to roll that back. So I wanted to ask you, perhaps since I'll, I'll get back to the review in a second, so we can uh, uh, stretch this out a little further, but um, Robert, um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a system called the early morning system that was introduced in 2009 by the, by the treaty of Lisbon. Uh, this allows national parliaments to issue yellow cards, red cards, um, and yet, only three yellow cards have been uh, submitted. No, uh, only three yellow cards, no orange cards at all have been submitted by national parliaments. So I wonder um, how seriously are national parliaments taking their, their role to uh, safeguard uh, subsidiarity? Um, and, and after all, even if they were uh, more deliberate in uh, you know, uh, uh, standing their curve, well, is the commission willing to listen to your view there? Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. They take it as seriously as they understand it. I, I would imagine that if you went to any number of uh, MPs on national level from any side of the political spectrum and asked them, did you know you had a yellow card? Did you know you had an orange card? I suspect a lot of them would probably say they didn't. I, I think one of the, the core problems here is that there is such little understanding of what happens in Brussels. I mean, it, it, it's difficult to understate how much of a bubble Brussels really is and how much of the policy making is done in a technical language. It's done in a way that's very inaccessible to ordinary people, to legislators, to all sorts. I think there's, there's a, I think it was best put by uh, the former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis recently, where, where he was asked, oh, what do you think of the democratic deficit in Brussels? He said, well, there is no democratic deficit in Brussels because there's no democracy in Brussels. It's like saying there's a, he said it was like saying that there was a deficit of oxygen on the moon. Sort of there is no oxygen. And, and it, you know, okay, perhaps he's over-exaggerating a bit because obviously we elect our MEPs who, who represent the national interest and so on. But he's right in the sense that the, the disconnect between the citizens, between national lawmakers and regional lawmakers, and what happens here is, is so vast that it, it makes it difficult to oppose what's going on often until it's too late. For, for the yeah, no, I, uh, it's, it, we, we're getting carried away in a very interesting in, uh, the direction. So let's, let's elaborate a bit on that. I wouldn't say there is more democracy, but what I, what I also wanted to add is that it's not enough not to have democratic deficit only on the if you look at the treaty, the way 
you know, the parliament is elected, the way uh, the commissioners are appointed, the way the president of the commission is, is, is also designated. That's very democratic. Right? That's very democratic. I, I, I never saw even in the, in the national uh, uh, parliaments, you know, like that commissioners or ministers need to be approved almost one by one by the government before they take office. And so from a strictly legal point of view, I don't see this democratic deficit. But that again will be missing the real point. And the real point is something that uh, Robert already uh, pointed out, which is that indeed there is, you must be identified, you must understand. And if it's the case, if it's already not the case for national parliaments, imagine how it can be for normal citizen for a regular citizen. And so it's true that again it's a very bureaucratic approach to take the book, take the EU treaty and say, oh but everything is explained here and everything is, is fine. It's according to the standards. No democratic deficit also means that the persons you know, who are the citizens are also also get an understanding and a sense of identification. And this is the real problem that we don't have. Coming back to the national parliaments, it's true that this protocol introduced in 2009 is, is not flawless. Huh? It's certainly not flawless. First, it's not a system of yellow and red cards, it's a system of, as you said, of yellow and orange cards. Huh? Uh, there's no possibility for a majority of the national parliaments to block the proposal or propose it. Second, it's true that if we, at the end of the day, we only had three, so it basically in 15 years, we had three yellow. This is the, 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 the record. It, it, it speaks by itself. You know, it means that national parliaments, you know, were not properly involved. Sometimes because they didn't want it, but maybe sometimes because again they don't feel identified, they don't feel involved in it. I can also I imagine national parliaments that you know, are really pretty busy and pretty bureaucratic themselves. That suddenly they need to have a new committee or a new survey that is going to pre-screen every single legislative proposal that comes from Brussels. And then, you know, whenever they want, they can, uh, they have to coordinate themselves. Difficult. And then the third thing I wanted to point out is that the only yellow card they witnessed myself, when I was an EU official, was on the posting of workers. Very, very divisive topic, very political topic. And there, I must say that the way the European Commission reacted to this yellow card was more or less a repetition of the arguments, you know. So it was, a bit mechanical. It was didn't trigger a real discussion among the national parliaments who were posing this uh, this uh, the directive and the European Commission. So there again, maybe it was a good intention, but the way it's implemented, it's uh, it's not enough. It's not enough. And maybe there is a way made of involving a smarter way of involving and maybe a more glamorous, more a sexier way of attracting way of of. Uh, of uh, national communities. We are not yet there. Sure. And allow me to, to stay with you on this question, and, and uh, Robert, I'll also get back to you uh, after this. Um, I want to shift gears to, uh, to judicial matters, which you briefly mentioned uh, at the start, uh, because you know we're talking about safeguards uh, to uphold subsidiarity. We're talking about the role of national parliaments. We're talking about building a culture of subsidiarity so that um, uh, the citizens and the decision makers aren't uh, you know, drifting towards uh, an, an overstretched understanding of their their, uh, their role, their competences, and I wanna I wanna uh, bring in another another uh, supposed safeguard that we have, uh, which is the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is supposed to have judicial review over uh, these matters, and and also uh, it could, in principle, annul uh, EU measures on subsidiarity grounds. And uh, instead, what we've seen is we've seen this, uh, as, we, as we explained at the start. Uh, this pro this pro union pro yeah, integration uh, tendency across the case law of the CJEU, and I wanted to I wanted to ask you know from, from your experience your, you also have a legal background uh, is is subsidiarity uh, judicially enforceable? Uh, it should it should it should clearly and for example not not even from a judicial point of view but for example the, the annual report that the commission produces a subsidiarity I mean I have spe specific recommendations on how to improve it and to be it. Let me give you a, a very recent example uh, that happened last week. I'm going to quote somebody. Uh, so it's a translation. It's a head of state, a European head of state, 
Okay, I'm speaking about the judgment of the European Court of Justice, which says, which I believe in the European path when I understand it and what is good for the destiny of my nation. Who said that? Orban? No. Morawiecki? No. Boris Johnson before the Brexit? Neither. That's Macron. Emmanuel Macron reacting to anticipating, to be more precise, a judgment of the Court of Justice from last week. It's on the implementation, so the application, sorry, of the working time directive to the army, to the French army. So it's a Slovenian case, it's a Beta and a Slovenia. It's a preliminary ruling, it's on the 15th of July, so literally one week ago. But that, this is, for example, a case that you know, uh, made a lot of noise in France. Because France doesn't understand that the working time directive, which basically limits you know, the working time of workers and employees in the European Union, also applies to the army. Mm -hmm. So we are not here to discuss you know, the, 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 the substance, but France's argument is that you have an article 4, paragraph 2 of the treaty, one of the first articles that says national security remains the sole responsibility of each member state. And still, the Court of Justice found a way to contradict an article of the treaty through a directive, so through secondary legislation. And he said, well, when basically the conclusion of the European Court of Justice is, okay, when you are fighting, yes, this directive does not apply. But if you're not fighting, it does apply. And for and France took it very, very badly. I mean, look at the at the declarations of the, of the French defense minister, his declaration of Macron again. We are lucky it's Macron. Imagine Orban saying that. I mean, you will be already you know, the, for, for five days in the world political, no? And uh, and so again, how is it possible that the Court of Justice manages to circumvent one major article of the treaty through secondary legislation? That's for example, and it even annoyed the super pro European. This is what we are talking about. And so, and this is only one example, a very recent example. But another one, for example, is, is also like the, the, or the, the, the case of the Court of Justice on the, on the Polish uh, mm -hmm. you know, judicial system. I was looking, you know, to, I was looking at the, the legal base. And the legal base, you know, to justify all that, is this Article 19. And Article 19 says simply, it's a bit longer than that, but Article 19, uh, Paragraph 1, uh, Member States shall provide remedies sufficient to ensure effective legal protection in the fields covered by you. Mm -hmm. It's a bit longer, I don't want to read it in Paris, but read it at home carefully. Do you think this legal basis really justifies the new competence of the European Union to decide, you know? Uh, Unilateral to control uh, you know, the, the internal judicial organization in the member states. And that also takes us back to Article 7, which is an article that personally I don't like. Why? Because it's in total confrontation with this principle of conferral of competences. Mm -hmm. Article 7 allows the European Union to judge everything, absolutely everything. So Article 7 and Article 5 are in total opposition. How can we decide about it? And so you see, there again, we also have to make sure to avoid judicial activism, mm -hmm. to avoid also uh, uh, politicization sometimes of, uh, of, the, of the judicial power. And we are not the only ones saying that here. I mean, we have several cases now. We will soon have a war of Supreme Courts between the European mm -hmm. uh, Court of Justice, and not, not only the Polish one, but what about the German one, the German Constitutional Court? Those guys are not. Populist nobodies, and it has already been 50, more than 50 years that they have a look. And those are like the super famous for language cases. And recently, in 2020, they said again that look, you are going too far. You are doing things for which you don't have a legal case. Ultra virus in the region. So the cases are there. And again, I think one of the questions we should raise in the frame of the future of Europe is just to make sure that. We don't need to change the treaties, we just need to respect them. Mm -hmm. And we should start with Article 4 and Article 5. Mm -hmm. Robert, obviously, uh, judicial sovereignty, the ability to fashion uh, a, a judicial system that is uh, nationally run, was one of the flashpoints of the Brexit debate. 
it was really high on top of the agenda when uh, that campaign was raging on in 2015, 16 in your home country. Uh, how do you see the issue of judicial independence? We've also seen, as really well mentioned, the Polish case being really high on top of the agenda quite recently. Uh, where do you see this tendency to um, to have a, a, a unitary uh, a legal system that is that is overweening and that is to well, I, I think it goes back to how, how people choose to bring cases forward and how to use it. And it is often done on the basis of, oh, well, I've, I've lost at my national level. Perhaps I can get some extra leverage if I take it higher up to a, a European level. And we, we've seen that in the UK with some very high profile cases on extradition. On uh, In particular, it came up with... Um, sort of return of uh, convicted criminals to their to their home countries and so on. But I, I think the, the one that, uh, case that Rodrigo brought up that I think is very interesting is obviously the German Constitutional Court, uh, who recently uh, were presented a case about the recovery fund. And, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes, because the German Constitutional Court is sort of known for its, its rigorous interpretation of, of, uh, the, of the treaties in many ways. And, and when they say, you know, uh, the, the European uh, Union has no right to raise own resources, it has no right to issue bond issues and redistribute wealth in this way, you know, it, it, it should be taken seriously. So it'll be interesting to see if, if a similar case is ever brought in front of the um, European courts as to, to what will be the outcome of that. Because you know that the they'll try and manipulate it and come up with a, a, a looser interpretation. I mean, it, it's, it's as um, Rodrigo was saying, you know, that what we need to do is go back to a stricter reading of the treaties and of the, uh, um, of the principles uh, enshrined in them. Uh, and, it, and it, you know, it's a point that you also made earlier about um, the principle of the rule of law. You know, we we so often see the European Commission criticizing member states for alleged violations of the rule of law, which often aren't, you know, aren't held up. There's no basis for them. But at the same time, we watch them undermine their own treaties and, and act beyond their own means. I mean, it would be interesting to see if at some stage someone were to bring up the, the sort of in, infringement on health policy. You know, I, I, I'd like to see where the courts rule on that, whether they find some way to claim that it was a, a, a security measure or something. You know, it, 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 I think there's, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked with the, with the European court system. Sure. Uh, you know, we're nearing the end of the time we have for today, but you're touching on something that is uh, crucially important. And I know that for legal care is a great deal about this, so I'm going to turn to you now. Um, this issue of European boundaries, which are very abstractly uh, laid, laid out in, in the treaties of, in, 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 uh, briefly mentioned that they're being interpreted and, uh, and stretched out, their meaning is being stretched out in all these possible ways in a very progressive direction. And that's also being invoked uh, uh, as, as a way to have you know, the, the commission sort of uh, uh, sermonize, uh, uh, moralize member states that diverge from uh, the dictates that, that come out of Brussels. How do you see this issue of European values? Do you think we can come back to an understanding of them that doesn't, that isn't ideologically uh, supportive? No, thank you. Uh, I see it in a, maybe in a bit less uh, radical way that you express in your, your question, but but still, what you say, I mean, there is there, there are elements there that are relevant enough to again to be put on the table. Look at read yourself Article Two of the Treaty. It's very generic. It's very vague. By the way, is it so European? I have doubts. I'm sure you can find an equivalent in the Constitution of Japan, of Australia, by the way. I mean, they, they sound to me more universal than they, than they are European. But anyway, fair enough. And they are open to interpretation. And my starting position will be that it's, I believe in the European Union where you have 27 different interpretations of those values, okay? And not one only. Not one that is only in the air du temps, just because it's mainstream, then it must be applied to everyone else. And if, if one day that happened again, you must have the legal basis for a specific decision of the European Union, so a conferral of competences. And what we see with the very controversial case you know, of, the, of the Hungarian law of protection of minors, and that's where we say, uh, is that suddenly 
unilaterally, without any previous discussion, a very specific interpretation of those values became the official interpretation, the legal interpretation that cannot be discussed. And this is a holdup of art. This is a confiscation of the European values. This is an interpretation that only admits very specific political interpretation. If this is how some member states see Article 2, fine, fine, I don't have problems with that. I don't think it's for conservative governments to, to use Article 2 to impose their views mm -hmm. on liberal governments, but I also think that it shouldn't be the other way around. What we are seeing now is that it got made around. Basically, you have 17 member states that think that is only that basically that their values, their interpretation of Article 2 is just superior, is morally superior, and straight on to impose it on others. I mean, tell me if, why, on what basis can you claim that Article 2 prohibits parents from being the leading educators of their children? Nowhere. On what basis do you claim that you can discriminate parents from educating their children? I mean, non discrimination is legally speaking a very complex thing. It means that you cannot treat two similar situations uh, unequally, but it also means that you cannot treat equally two different situations. And then, you know, without thinking, without reflecting, without listening to the others, you just, by decree, declare that, you know, not, uh, uh, that, uh, not letting the right of the parents prevail is tantamount to discrimination. That's it. End of the discussion. Again, we fail to understand this login in Article 4. I just read it this morning. Yeah? But Article 4 clearly says that you have different traditions in the European Union. And that must be also, also when do people think about it? Let me just read it for you. But basically, the Union shall respect the equality of member states before the treaty as well as their national identities. Below, in Article 4, Paragraph 2 doesn't exist for one. Inherent in their fundamental structures, political, constitutional, inclusive of regional and local self government. Uh, the respect of their essential state functions, and so on and so forth. This is the, the article on national security. But again, I'm a bit sick to hear about diversity, diversity, and those who preach the most about diversity are those implementing the mm -hmm. Diversity means first and foremost, not sexual diversity, it means political diversity, mm -hmm. intellectual diversity. And tolerance means to accept things you dislike. And I guess that the Hungarian government or Polish government dislike the law on euthanizing for minors in Belgium. But they still don't use Article 2 to try to kill it because it's none of their business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the culture of solidarity also means that the, European, the best answer the European Union can give is sorry, sorry NGOs, but this is none of my business. And they never do. Yeah. Any comment from you, Robert, on this uh, issue? Again, Margaret Thatcher was fond of uh, arguing for a marketplace of governments that afforded uh, national governments the ability to carve out their path and, and, and that allowed for political diversity of the kind that the legal is, is also arguing for. What's your, what's your view on this? Well, if, if I just go back to the very basic point of European values, I mean, what is a European value? You know, as, as Rodrigo said, there's the, there's, there's the liberal democratic values, which we all subscribe to, which is a democracy, the rule of law, uh, free and fair elections, freedom of speech, freedom, you know, all of that sort of thing. But then at the other end of it, we're talking about European values as though there's some common theme throughout it. I mean, there are different understandings of what those values mean. If you were to use the word liberty in France and use the same word liberty in the Netherlands or in Germany or in uh, even in the UK, you'd get completely different answers as to what it actually means to someone. Uh, including sort of more obscure things like positive and negative liberty. You know, in, in France, the French constitution is all about the rights conferred onto a citizen by the state. Whereas if you were to take a, a uh, Anglophone approach to liberty, it's a notion of negative liberty. It's this idea that my rights are my, I, you know, they are inalienable natural rights that you're born with and that your rights are a freedom from the state. So it's not that the state has given me the freedom of speech. It is my right to freedom from the state telling me how I can speak. So there's that side of it. And then, you know, it, it's about how do we interpret that on a European level? So as, as Rodrigo said, there's no, you know, why, why should Western European states continue to have this paternalistic view of uh, 
the sort of younger states that joined after 2004 and telling them how to do things. You know, they're independent nations with their own views and their own value sets uh, that have come from a very different place than those in the West. Those in the West have had a much more comfortable life. And, you know, they in many ways have become complacent and used to these principles of things like, and taken for granted principles of, of having free and fair elections and having a, a, a free judiciary and free speech and so on. So why, you know, people in, in Central Eastern Europe have had to fight for a generation to have those rights restored. So they don't need to be told by Western Europeans what their values should be. They know what their values are because they've struggled for them. They, they didn't have them a generation ago. They've, they've only just restored them. So I think there's, there's that side of it as well. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. And also, let, let me add also, sorry, I used to be a technocrat, so let me add a bit of a, a, a legal background here. But how is it possible that in the statements of objections, basically the letter of formal notice that the Commission sent to, to Hungary on that matter, that Article 165 is totally 165 is on education and what it is. And it stays crystal clear that the union does that and that while fully respecting the responsibility of the member states for the content of teaching and the organization of the education system. The content, this article, if we can still read, means that the content of education is none of the EU's business. And still, they find the twist legal basis on free movement of goods, free movement of services, on the audiovisual directive, to, again, to deprive from any content an article of the treaty. So you have secondary law that is used to circumvent primary law. What does the article mean if the commission, whenever it thinks it's the case, so it gives a lot of power to the commission, can send an infringement, you know, ignoring article 165. And then you, Robert mentioned, insisted on the, on the national diversity, yes, there are things we don't understand about the universe. Among my 27 best friends, there are things I don't understand about them. And you know, if I don't like the way their house works, the way they educate the children, I should just accept it. And look, for example, look at the example of the French life that you know well as uh, okay. I, I understand this, uh, the, the French approach to nicety, but in the Anglo Saxon world, the world, I mean, to claim for I mean to basically explain how people should be dressed on the street or when they accompany a school, you know, to the zoo, it's pretty shocking for you. you know? And there are things I don't understand about your culture, Robert, because and you are there are things you don't understand about mine. And that's fair enough, and that's good enough. Look at this diversity. Look at what Macron did. And to me, a very courageous policy against Islamic uh, Islamist uh, separatism, as he has it posted. And then it has been portrayed as Islamophobic, as discriminatory by the Financial Times, by the New York Times, I mean, by how many of those? Imagine that one day, you know, this strikes back on France. And then you have a majority of member states that say, oh, but Monsieur Macron, you like it, it is Islamophobic, it's discriminatory, it goes against the values of the European Union, it goes up, uh, against Article 2, so you cannot do it. Sorry, you cannot stop prohibiting like the niqab and the burqa in the public spaces. Imagine that you can go to the French. How would they react? How would they react? Maybe with a referendum like what I just decided yesterday? I don't know. But again, is it the EU's business to do that? Do we need that to have uh, good neighbors that cooperate on specific issues and have very, very integrated internal markets? We just forgot. And then again, I'm very afraid of use the legal basis that are totally unrelated to a file to basically circumvent the treaty is so, That's pure arbitrariness. Sure. And we're, we're nearing uh, the end of our time here, but uh, this is such a key point and uh, it's surely uh, one, of the, one of the purposes of our conversation here today is to, is to draw out what are, what are the, uh, the, 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 the dangers from, from uh, sliding down this path where, um, you know, Wherever more areas of policy can be uh, uh, can be uh, you know grounds for the Commission to uh, supersede national uh, sovereignty and, and uh, Roberto Rodrigo uh, outlined a fair amount of them. But I want to I want uh, uh, to, to finish off my, my last question is going to be uh, rather rather simple, and I just want to get your uh, uh, your uh, quick fire answers on what do you think are uh, areas of policy of competence that uh, should be uh, renationalized. 
obviously we're talking when, when it comes to subsidiarity to areas where the union and the member states share competences. And as, as Rodrigo explained at the start, subsidiarity is a compass to navigate that gray area and to apportion power uh, where, where it is due. Um, if subsidiarity, even if it's in the trees, does not operate in, in practice, uh, then isn't the solution devolution, right? So uh, we can't treat uh, power back to the member states. I want to I want to start with Robert. Obviously, that was uh, a big uh, a big item in the Brexit campaign, and uh, I want to get your take first on what, what you think, uh, what policy areas could be ideally uh, repatriated back to member states. Well, I'm I'm very Jeffersonian about this, and I I think that actually quite a lot of it should be handed back to the member states, with I think exception of. Uh, things like immigration and border control, because that's unavoidable in the Schengen area. I think with policy like the harmonization of the internal market to ensure that it's as easy, free and accessible as possible for, for all of its members. And I, I would probably argue uh, to a certain degree security policy, uh, but NATO seems to already do that better. So I, I don't believe, for example, in the expansion of the common security and defense policy to an extent that it, it replicates NATO's capabilities. But I think that there is some merit to having a, a more robust defense of our, our institutions and of, of our uh, nation states with a collective security. Could you have to pick? Yes, if I, if I had to, take, so to pick up some uh, concrete examples, I would say, first of all, okay, that's super controversial, but I would delete Article 7. Uh, to start with Article 7, I think if you want to double check if the member states are respecting the rule of law, there is a Venice Commission, there is a Council of Europe, and there is a European Court of Human Rights doing that. I don't see why the European Union should do that. It's really not in its core business. Not least because it doesn't respect the principle of concurrent competence. And second, that is the way it's put in the in Article 7, it is a political procedure. Something that can be launched by either the Commission or the European Parliament is per se political. And you're mixing here judicial review and political intentions. Not a good idea. Second example, some aspects of social policy, the working time directive. I mean, why? I mean, do we need in order to have an integrated internal market, have the same opening uh, hours in every member state? Do we need that? I don't think so. Another example recently is that also a uh, uh, decision of the European Court of Justice on the, uh, if, if it's lawful uh, to wear a veil, an Islamic veil, in, mm -hmm. at work. Mm -hmm. At the end, the ECJ says that in some circumstances you can prohibit that. But I'm not speaking here about the, the decision as such with, with which I agree. That's not the point. The point is, when I read that, I say, why on, hell, why on earth, sorry, is it for the European Court of Justice to decide on something like that? Well, because you have a directive, directive on non discrimination in employment. Uh, you know, like the place of employment. Why do we have it? And again, I would prefer a European Union where you have some countries that say, look, for me it's fine, and others who say, for me it's not fine. And in the UK, for example, I'm sure that you have a lot of kindergartens where the, the, the nurses are, are wearing pain. You know? I don't like it. You like it? Good enough. I don't care about it. Why should we centralize decisions that should be taken? at the local or national level. And again, this is uh, we, we are now uh, you know, back to the circle. This is a matter of cultural subsidiarity. If subsidiarity was not understood, nobody would have ever put on the table a proposal of discrimination in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the place of employment, and no one would have approved it. Again, here I don't want to blame the commission on it. The end is also 27 member states and the European Parliament who went in that direction. But again, at the end, you have that. You have an ECJ, European Court of Justice decision, whether it's uh, you know, lawful or not, to wear a day in the place of employment. The question is fair, but it should be answered at the national or regional level, not at the European one. Again, you know, what if the European Union sometimes was just courageous enough to say, sorry, it is none of my business. It is none of my business. And there are underlying question there as well is the echo chamber effect in process. When you're in Nico Channel, where you listen mostly to NGOs, uh, and you confuse social, civil society with uh, public opinion, the artist risk. And also, when you only read, there's a total lack of mediatic diversity. You read always the same newspapers that go in the same direction, the same newsletters that you get every morning, that goes in a certain direction. 
and you lack total, it, it kills your discernment, discernment and your critical thinking. Again, yes, I think that the European Union will work better and will last much longer if at some point it's honest enough to say, guys, this is none of my business, leave me alone. Well, this is, this is indeed a, a really, a, a really a great place to end our conversation. I think we've explored all the different facets of subsidiarity and really uh, brought, brought home the point that this is not just a matter that should be analyzed legalistically. This really um, should be the basis for a culture, a liberal culture of subsidiarity where uh, all of our societies are um, imbued with a sense that um, decisions should be taken where, uh, where uh, you know, competences belong and that we shouldn't infringe upon that. And I just want to thank our panelists. And thanks to you. It's been really, thank you so much. It's been really delightful. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining us. New Direction, uh, you've been uh, joining us remotely from Brussels and really well. I head the Center for European Studies uh, here at MCC. But most of all, I want to thank our audience uh, for joining us for uh, slightly shy of an hour. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and, uh, and stay tuned for all the great events that MCC is going to be putting together as uh, the Conference of the Future of Europe uh, gets, uh, continues apace. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.